Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, longtime unschooling mom and author. Join me and my wonderful guests for interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free introductory ebook, What is Unschooling?, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hi, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 104 of the podcast. I've recorded this short intro ahead of time as I've taken the week off for the holidays. And it's Q&A time. Ann Oman and Anna Brown join me again to answer your questions. We dig into questions around when parents are at odds over parenting choices, ways to share information with more conventional parents, teens making community connections and considering school, and ways to handle when a child calls themselves stupid. I hope you guys are enjoying the holiday season, even as things are busy, maybe even especially as things are busy. Remember to play and have fun. And now, on to your questions. Welcome to another Q&A episode. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca, and I'm happy to be joined again by Ann Oman and Anna Brown. Hi to you both. Hello. Hello. Yay, I'm so excited. And would you <laughs> like to get us started, Anna? Sure. So question one is an anonymous question from Ireland. Hi, thank you so much for your great podcast and all the work you're putting into answering our questions every month. We're on our journey to unschooling since November last year, and it's been very exciting. Our children are currently eight, six, and two. My question is about my husband. He didn't like the idea of taking our two older kids out of school, but finally agreed to it last year because I never stopped talking about it and felt my daughter eight wasn't thriving at all. So he agreed and changed his mind a lot about schools and learning since. He could see how much happier the kids seemed after leaving school and how much they were learning every day. However, he's much stricter than I am and expects a lot of them. The kids usually know the difference and everything seems to go well as long as they are just with one of us. But the problems arise when we do things together as a family. I just can't stand the way he shouts at them sometimes or tells them to go to their room. When they were younger, he even locked them outside the door sometimes or tells them to shut up moaning, etc. So I usually interfere, but then our kids have to choose sides. And my husband says that I criticize him all the time. He says, I don't want to change and mold my children, but I want him to change him. And he is right, I suppose. He also says I should find better ways of dealing with the situation before they go out of hand. But I'm often at a loss, too. When I'm on my own with our children, many of these situations don't even arise because I don't expect them to sit still and eat their dinner, etc. I give them lots more time to find solutions together and don't rush them out the door or tell them to stop doing something immediately. How can I value my husband for who he is without letting him hurt our children? He can be very gentle and loving too, but usually when they are behaving in the way he wants them to. Our daughter is able to play the, quote, good girl for most of the time now when she is with him, but our six-year-old son is much more emotional and extreme in his feelings and expressions, which drives my husband crazy. I really don't know how to improve these situations. Do I step back and let them have their own relationship without interfering or protect my children more? I told them one day that their father was raised in a very strict way, too, because that's what people often did back then, and that's why he often gets angry now. He used to smack them sometimes when they were younger, but I didn't tolerate that, and he stopped, although he still thinks a little smack isn't that bad. I hope I didn't make my husband sound like a monster. He has many wonderful sides, too, but the parenting thing seems to be something we can't find any solution to. Thank you for your input. So, okay, hello. Um, That sounds like a lot. It's a lot for all of us to take in and I know it's a lot for you to be dealing with on a day-to-day basis and it can feel sometimes very hard to find common ground in some situations so when those times arise for me I just fall back on the same tools that we talk about with our children listening assuming positive intent validation and then moving towards finding solutions together 
In this situation, I would also maybe not look at the global picture as much um, and work towards together towards solving individual issues. And as you get more of those under your belt and, and figure out ways to make those individual situations work better, that bigger picture will change. And I think it might help in your language of talking about it. So, for example, if you pick an issue where you're struggling and, and maybe just as an example, it's meals, because you mentioned something about that, you know, talk to your husband. What is he looking for? What would he like to see in his meals? Why is he feeling frustrated? Really understanding where he's coming from may help you find workable solutions. You know, maybe he's coming home from work and he needs quiet time or a quiet meal. It, it, he's been overwhelmed during the day. If that's the case, then maybe the kids could eat ahead of time and be playing while he has his meal quietly. Or if he wants everyone together talking about realistic expectations and way to make that fun and workable, but kind of understanding what may be coming out as the barking orders or telling them to be quiet or sit down and do may be coming from some underlying needs or things that he's having to deal with. And so when he can feel heard with that, then maybe there's other ways for that expression for us to meet those needs. Um, my husband likes to talk about the 80-20 rule. So what's causing the most rub right now and focus your energy there. And then the rest of it seems a lot easier when you kind of tackle some big chunks. So look at your kind of overall situation. And is it, you know, when you go out, is it when you're in, is it the meals, is it whatever, like find some of those things to kind of focus attention on. Um, and, and it may help to talk to him about his upbringing. You know, how did he feel when he was being yelled at or hit or not heard? You know, sometimes just having that conversation can help a person see that repeating that pattern doesn't really feel good and that they don't want to be a part of it. They didn't like it then. Why are they doing it now? And that seems obvious. But honestly, I think some people really don't have that connection. It's just that's what they know. That's what they do. And realizing there's a different way can help share why you're choosing a different way, what it means to you, why it's important to you, because he loves you and, and he's seeing why you're making the changes and what brought you to that can help him understand that it's not just to thwart him or to make his life more difficult, that there's reasons behind it. And, and again, that's a connection point. You know, talking together as, as partners as to what type of energy you want in the house. You know, conflict energy is a lot of work and it's draining and it doesn't feel great. So putting that work into finding solutions and partnering together just feels so much better to me. And I think most people find the same. You know, and there may be ways to help him see that the skills of listening and finding solutions that we talk about are so important in life and that practicing those skills at home gives everyone a huge leg up when they're out in the bigger world. And I think I would just also focus on connecting with him, letting him know he is loved and heard. Your third child is pretty young and adding a sibling can throw everyone out of whack for a while. So maybe be easy on yourself and everyone as they transition with that too. And even giving words to that, to him that, you know, the baby is now too, but it was, you know, we added this new person and now there's new dynamics and we're still figuring that out. And so it doesn't feel so global again. It kind of brings it down into the moment. And in the end, it's just trust that as you connect and love him, that the two of you can find common ground for your home and create an energy and a loving environment where all of you can thrive and feel safe. Anne? That was just so perfectly wonderful. Um, and yeah, I just uh, have more um, reinforcement about um Connecting with your husband and, uh, you know, because the gifts of unschooling, um, I, I always say for the whole family, uh, then I feel like uh, we, the parents who are home, you know, with our children, learning about parenting, learning about our connection together and our relationships and um, unschooling, um, we kind of have to take the initiative to extend that to uh, the rest of the members of our family, our life partner. <laughs> and I, I mean, I'm utilizing it now, extending it to my employee at the library and everything. So, you know, <laughs> we, we, we have this, this insight um, because of being students of our children and being the ones who are connecting to other unschoolers and everything of how to help our family connections. Um, so yeah, definitely um, utilize that. And um, so back 
up um, the fact that your husband says you criticize him all the time and he came right out and almost asked you to see him as you see your children, you know what I mean? And um, stop trying to change him. So think of the way you see your children. If they're having behavior that seems off to you, you, you know, um, I have always known that that's the time to give more love and to focus even more on uh, their shine and um, help them feel good about themselves. And then when they're in a place of feeling good about themselves, they can relax into that and they lose their defensiveness. And um, like Anna was saying, your, then your connection together is stronger and uh, he's feeling seen and heard and celebrated. And um, there's validation in there as well, validating, like Anna was saying, uh, what he wants about, you know, at the dinner table and everything, validating that he has had a hard day at work. And it's a lot when the kids are, you know, leaving the table and running around, whatever. So um, it's really about just coming back and uh, focusing on, on your connection, your relationship, and uh, remembering uh, the environment that we create in order for our children to learn naturally, we don't, we're not criticizing them all the time. We're not on their every move, you know, disapproving and judging them. Um, so maybe, you know, you wrote beautiful things about your husband. So have that be your focus um, and see him relax. It's, you know, like I said, it's time to give more love and just, you know, I think things will really bloom after that um, shift has been made. Pam? Yeah, that's, that's great because it's so true. Unschooling is an environment that we're creating for the whole family in our home. So that's that's always a great place to start. And I mean, you, you mentioned it too, um, his relationship with his children is his to navigate. Doesn't mean we leave them alone on their own. Same thing we don't do, you know, with our children. But uh, maybe you can think of your work as supporting him as he explores the parent he wants to be, not changing him into the parent you want him to be because he's not you. See, so that's that subtle but so important shift in perspective that helps him feel s seen for who he is and supported for who he is. And as he, he pointed out, right, right now you're trying to change him to meet your expectations. And that creates that resistance in him. Um, and, and it makes, makes it about you and him. All these issues are about you and him and not about him and his children, where that's where the focus can be with him and how he would like to relate to his children and just um, his needs within the family. His needs are just as valuable as anyone else's within the family, but it, it's not just, as with our children, it's not just wholesale um, say yes to everything, right? It's conversations, it's digging in, it's figuring out, it's understanding ourselves and each other. Um, so ask yourself, how can you help him have the relationship with his children that he wants? Um, again, without changing your children, they are who they are. It's about bringing that all together. And by experience, then that focus shifts from telling him what to do in situations to chatting about them after as he processes them. And Anna's point about, you know, picking the 80-20, the picking the big ones, you know, to start with. So... After um, things happen like that, you can process with him, like validating, reflecting, offering your observations and sharing insights into your kid's point of view because he's working and you're the one that gets uh, to spend um, all this extra time with them. So you understand them more deeply. You understand their reactions. You understand their point of view. So you can share those little insights with him again so he has more information. It's just all fodder for his processing, not about changing him. Because if you've got that expectation at the end, that can be felt in the conversations, right? I think at some point it might also be helpful to mention to him that this isn't about unschooling at all, that you would be parenting the same way even if your kids went back to school. I find sometimes unschooling takes the blame for all these challenges because it's like an easy target. It was a huge change you guys made in your lives. Um, and sometimes other people can get fixed on, well, sending them back to school will fix everything. No, this is this is a parenting thing. Um, all at least all the issues that that you mentioned in your question 
And the other piece that you mentioned was without hurting the children. And, and that is something else. So definitely, as you mentioned, you can have conversations with your kids about how he was raised so that they better understand his perspective. Um, just the same as you're sharing what you know about your children with him. So it's more information that everybody in the family is getting. Um, and your kids can understand that some of his actions stem from his experience and what he knows and they're not really about them personally um so you can focus on sharing all these observations not conclusions and giving everybody the space to draw the conclusions for themselves see how they fit into their own picture so you know when you're talking with your kids i probably wouldn't say like your dad does this because of that um it's more in line with in your dad's family, you know, it was expected that kids do this and, and, you know, just sharing those um, pieces of information, not judgments. Um, also do what you can to anticipate and minimize any conflict. You know, if there's stuff that they enjoy doing with their dad, encourage that. If things go more smoothly when he's hanging out with one kid at a time, encourage that, set that up, try to set them all up, kids and your husband for success, knowing what you know about all three of them, because you're the one in that unique position to better understand them. So you're also in that unique position to be able to support all of them in developing a relationship. But when things do go off the rails, don't try to minimize that or ignore that. Again, it's more fodder and information for him to learn about his children and to contemplate the kind of relationships that he wants to have with them. And as uh, they mentioned already, it might be a moment where you can bring up his own upbringing and, and kind of relate that and make that connection for him if he hasn't made it. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> You want to go to question two, Anne? Sure. Our question two is from Amy in Virginia. And she writes, hello, ladies. I first want to say what a blessing this podcast is to me each week and how grateful I am to all of you contribute to its production. So yay, Pam. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys. And everybody else. Uh, my question is about sharing the parenting philosophies embodied in unschooling with people who are not currently home or unschooling. I have five children, ages 27, 24, 17, 16, and 14. We naturally fell into a respectful parenting paradigm as we saw that traditional parenting seemed to fit the description of when you keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, that is the definition of insanity. <laughs> we are Christian parents who see our kids as our neighbors and friends and apply the lessons we learn in scripture about loving, caring for, honoring, and helping others, not just those outside our home, but firstly to those inside it. We absolutely love the relationships we have with our teens and don't believe that the typical rebellious teen years are a given in raising children. It breaks my heart to see my nieces who are just starting out on this adventure we call motherhood share the struggles they're having with their kids and just getting the same old traditionally authoritarian from other parents that isn't working for any of them the same goes for hanging out with other parents of teens and listening to them lament their struggles but then all agree that they just need to be tough and survive it are there any books podcasts or other resources you can direct me to so that i may share them with other parents who might want more from their parent child teen relationships okay hi amy thank you so much for writing in to us uh, the very short answer to your direct question at the end is any book written by Pam Larickia. <laughs> <laughs> and the book I haven't written yet about how all children shine when celebrated for being exactly who they are. <laughs> 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 but of course, I'm going to give you a much longer answer. <laughs> so uh, just bear with me and my stories that I'm sharing here. Uh, with my sons being 23 and 27, I have spent many years observing mainstream parenting, especially since I really began questioning it all very early on in my own life, probably as a child, um, when I myself was feeling misunderstood and confused by my parents and mainstream society. And even then, I just knew things different for me when I was a parent myself. 
And for the most part, um, my family and I have created a life where we choose to surround ourselves with people whose parenting is in alignment with our own, because I really believe in creating life that allows our children and ourselves to feel free to shine. So I just want to throw that out there because sometimes we don't realize um, we can redefine community and even family and create exactly what we want that feels good and right to us. And that's the energy that my family and I have chosen to create and live. And having said that, there are still some times, of course, when we are a witness to mainstream parenting. Um, lately, in fact, I've been more and more aware of it and thinking about it because I started a preschool story time at my library back in October. And honestly, just last week, I was driving home for lunch after um, having my story time. And I just kept thinking, this is why mainstream parents are exhausted all the time. <laughs> They're they are always trying to get their children to do something that the children don't want to do, or they're trying to get their children to be their idea of who they should be when the child simply, of course, just needs to be celebrated for being exactly who they are. And man, how exhausting is that? It's, it's paddling upstream. It's constantly fighting a battle. And I really don't know who would want to sign up for that. But that's exactly what they're doing. They're going along with mainstream and signing up for this of trying to get the child to be the child dream society would find. So on that day, that morning, when I was thinking that um, in the library, when I was having my story time, within the two hours that I was there before lunch, I heard numerous parents say that they're trying to get their child to, you know, fill in the blank, whatever. <laughs> One of them had who at the previous story time had gotten up from the room where we were singing and playing percussion instruments. And she walked away and told her father that it was too loud for her. So when they came in last week, I told her I thought that was a great idea that she had to not be in the room where the music was too loud for her. Her father said, I'm trying to get her to be a part of a group setting, though. I think it's good for her. And another parent told me that the rock creatures we made for the craft was genius because it was the first time her son was interested in doing the craft. And she had been trying to get him to do the craft every week. <laughs> so. Both of them are trying to get their children to be something other than who they are. They think they're trying to get their child to do something, but no, they're not seeing who their child is. So here's what I did, and here's what I've really been doing for all the years since I've had my own children. Um, I plant the seeds of celebration, honor, and respect for all of the children for simply being who they are, and that's because that's who I am you know, kind of be the change thing. <laughs> and with the case of the child who felt the music was too loud and the father wanting to get her to tolerate it, I said to him, oh my goodness, I so understand what she's talking about though. I'm highly sensitive too. I often have to cover my ears for things that other people don't even notice. And right then I seriously could see his brain doing a pivot, mm -hmm. a pivot away from thinking that he needed to make his something and to pivot toward truly seeing her for who she is he smiled really big and they nodded I honestly think he was thinking yeah actually I do too you know <laughs> and uh, I told him that my 27 year old son's highly sensitive and bring that about him for all of his life has us to examine things in our lives that we wouldn't have thought about otherwise and what a gift it's been for all of us I asked this dad if he's read the, the highly sensitive child and we went forward from there uh, in the other case of the child enjoying the rock creatures, I have been planting seeds in this about truly seeing her son for weeks now. This child is amazing. He always has a story going on in his head, kind of like my little 27-year-old boy. <laughs> <laughs> and I really am so honored when he excitedly runs into the library with one of his dinosaurs and he wants to share that dinosaur story with me. His mom is always saying how he's always off in his head somewhere as if that were a bad thing. <laughs> I simply show her how fascinated and in awe I am of her child's amazing and beautiful mind. I validate him. I interact with him with his stories. I encourage him when he takes his dinosaur and weaves it in and out of the bookends and has to climb a shelf and then dive way down and maybe knock some books over. <laughs> I basically honor that child for being exactly who he is. So when she told me the rock creature craft was 
good for him. I said to her, yeah, I saw that he was enjoying it. It was an open-ended craft, and he was able to make up his own stories about the rock creatures he was making. And again, I saw a pivot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we don't always see pivots. Was <laughs> This was cool. Um, oh, in fact, the other day, I thought of how to describe what that pivot looks like, and I need to tell you guys. <laughs> okay. It's, it's like these parents expect me to be someone who commiserates with them, right, about how hard it is to get their child to do something, because that's the conversation they're all having. And I hit that ball of frustration to me, and they expect that same ball to come back. But when that ball I return to them is completely different <laughs> from the one that they hit to me, they see that I'm not playing the same game here. Yeah. And that's the look on their faces with that pivot. At first, they're like poised and ready with a smile and a nod of knowing that someone else understands the exhausting frustration trying to get your child to do something. But then that smile disappears when they're not hearing that from me. And then their eyes get bigger because there's something coming at them they don't recognize immediately. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're confused for a moment and they're trying to figure out what just happened here. And then they actually hear what I'm saying. And the pivot is when that seems to land in a really pleasant way, in a way that might not feel as exhausting to them as their original energy that they had first sent out to me. So I, I loved, you know, kind of fine tuning what that pivot exactly looked like. Um, so in one case uh, of my stories, we have the dad who thought his daughter needed to get used to noises that felt too loud to her, who now looks at her and can say, oh, she's sensitive to that loud noise. Okay. And he can go forward in life from that place of honoring the part of who she is. And the mom who thought she had to get her son to do every craft now can look at him and think, okay, he'd like the rock creatures because he can make up his own stories. And she can go forward from that place of honoring him for who he is. And these are, you know, just two small examples of the thing from being who I am and um, believing in the children and honoring the children. And the thing also is I have no attachment to whether that seed grows or germ germinates or, you know, survives in the next five minutes or not, because I'm just sharing my perspective on what I see in a child. And I personally cannot allow my witnessing mainstream parenting um, to break me down. And I can't be following up with everybody to see how they're doing with their pivotal perspective. <laughs> because I'm my job here is to be living in joy and fun with my own family and to work on my own pivots that need to be made because that work really never ends. We're always doing our good work. But I can simply trust in their journey and I can simply stay in my energy of honoring and respecting and celebrating their children for being who they are because that gives them real life examples um, as to other possibilities that they might not have known even existed before, other ways to live in this wonderful world with their wonderful children. And that's the ball I'm returning to them in this volley. <laughs> um, when I start that story time in the morning and the kids are gathered on their big pet pillows in front of me, and man, I'm just beaming because I am so happy and honored that they're happy to be at the library with me. And we're talking a little bit the kids are sharing things with me and, you know, I'm there honoring and celebrating them. And the thing is, I know that these kids are watching me because their entire beings are just saying yes to my celebration of them as as they are. They know they are truly seen and heard with me. And so even if the parents don't pick up anything from being a witness to respect and celebration of a child, the children are paying attention. They're paying attention because they can feel that this is different and their entire beings can feel that this is the energy they deserve. And in that energy, they feel safe to really shine. And yes, this is the same with the teens I encounter as well. I focus on my connection with that teen. And if the parent is putting them down or trying to control them, and sadly, it does happen too often, I do what I can to connect with that teen in a joyful, light way that celebrates something about who they are. And you can just see that teen's energy pivot to a line for simply having been seen and honored. And oh my goodness, that teen's pivot <laughs> looks different than the parent's pivot. Mm -hmm. The teen immediately recognizes that ball I'm volleying to them. And they want to just grab that ball and hold on to it and take it home. <laughs> 
and they want they want they want more of those balls. They want me to keep hitting those balls to them. So, you know, it's in this way that the children hold on to these seeds that we're dropping simply by being who we are, and they do make a difference in their lives. And yeah, Amy, back to you. I am quite certain that it is in this way that your relationship with your own children has already planted many, many seeds. And you can go on to do that by being who you are and living your, uh, you know, stuff respectful lives together and mutually respectful relationships, sharing that with others. Pam? (laughs) Beautiful. And uh, not surprisingly, I chose the same metaphor. (laughs) (laughs) Because that's what it feels like, right? I mean, what I usually do in those moments is just plant seeds in the conversations that there is another way. So, um, especially in group conversations, right? I might just say, well, we ha- really haven't had that issue. Mm-hmm. Or I might pop in and say, oh, I really enjoy hanging out with my teen. And then just let things continue to flow. Because if that su- seed takes root, that's what I went with, takes root, uh, it may be a day later, a week later, six months later, they'll become curious and ask. And, and it may not. It may be years and I never see them again and don't know. But I have no expectation. I am just happy to share so that they just catch a glimpse that there might be another way. And and it really depends. Like uh, when you're asking for particular resources to share, it really depends on the person I'm chatting with. Like in Anne's story, um, the highly sensitive child came up in that conversation because that's where that person was. You know, if it's a if it's teens in relationships, I might pop up and mention the parenting breakthrough um, relationship approach book. But it really is so dependent on the kinds of questions uh, that the person's asking me. And I wouldn't um, w- I wouldn't, I don't think, offer up resources without a question or a connection or, you know, feeling right. that they're asking for that kind of thing. Be- because other than that, it feels like a judgment, right? if If they don't see a question there, a real question, Um, If they're not truly interested and open to learning more, then it's just going to um, feel more a a judgment on them when when they get it. Anyway, the other piece that has helped me is reminding myself, like in that previous question, that this is their journey to take. So whether it's a husband, whether it's whatever parent, this is their journey to take. And I can be, and my kids, we can be a living example of a different path, just as you are, Amy, with your kids. And we can plant these seeds here and there about other possibilities. But in the end, still, it, these are their choices to make. So that's that little piece of work that I do so that I don't feel um, you know, crestfallen or upset that other people are making different choices. They're on their journey. They are making the choices that make the most sense to them in that moment. And I can plant seeds and it's absolutely up to them and their life, whether or not or when they do germinate. Anna? Yeah, so <laughs> exactly the same in terms of I, I really just wanted to say it, it's about living your joy and connecting and those opportunities for planting those seeds come along all the time. And I would say when I was around younger parents, we did share resources and books and things that we liked. And so there are books that I like that are even unrelated to unschooling that um Again, it's kind of an evolution, but I think for people starting out, it's helpful. Kids, parents, and power struggles, how to talk so your kids will listen, how to listen so your kids will talk, kids are worth it. You know, those are a few um, that, you know, I have shared along the way that people have enjoyed. And, And sometimes it can be that little spark, that little connection, that little seed for them. And then they're like, oh, I get it. I see how that plays out in these different scenarios. Um, And so I do have a list of those books on choosingconnection.com. But um, but yeah, for me, really what I wanted to say to you, Amy, was just live your life and share your joy and talk about your kids and, and the relationships that you have and the love that you have, because that is really what inspires people. I mean, I think all three of us we've talked about before have people come up to us 
oh my gosh, I just love the relationship you have with your kids or, oh, the energy, your family is so different. And it, it really is just living our life. We, it ripples out from there. So just trust in that and trust in, in their journey and, and that they'll get there when they need to, if, if that's part of their journey. It's okay. That's all I have. Back to you, Pam. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's my turn for question number three, which is an anonymous question from the UK. <clears throat> We have been unschooling our two children for almost all of their lives. They had just two years in school. And my children, now 13 and 10, have been thriving in terms of personal growth, passions, interests, knowledge, skills, making decisions, learning about life and the world and relating to others, knowing who they are and what they like and dislike. In themselves, they're content with the choices they have in their daily lives within the constraints of our personal situation. We're always offering new opportunities and possibilities to them, which they are free to choose from. We make family decisions together about our home, pets, meals, holidays, etc. But they haven't really made a strong connection with the local home education community here, which we did have in previous towns, and I guess they are looking now for a sense of belonging. They feel they belong in our family and enjoy doing stuff together, but struggle with finding their place in our local neighborhood, despite trying various groups and voluntary work. All around them, they see children going to school and having that sense of belonging and experiencing something together. It's in the media, too. My teenager chose to go to school for a short time recently to make local friends and gain more independence because we have to travel to home ed gatherings. She achieved her goal and left school again, having made a group of nice friends she can hang out with several times a week. I was so happy for her. Now she is thinking about getting qualifications and is considering school again. It seems easier to her to go and do all the qualifications together with the new friends in one place than taking an alternative unschooling route with some online courses, self-study, tutoring, or home ed classes, etc. Although we have explored all these options and they are all feasible. She knows the pros and cons of school and how much anxiety it caused her when she went there briefly, but seems to have really bought into society's belief in this one route to getting qualifications. Now she's trying to persuade her younger sister to go as well, telling her she won't learn anything or get a good job if she doesn't. The youngest has started to consider school. I feel disheartened. If we had a local unschooling community that they felt they connected with and were supported by, perhaps they would feel more confident to be exploring this alternative way of life. It is hard for them to swim against the tide and be different. They just want security and to fit into society as they see it. My youngest child has a few good friends, but she admits that she struggles to make new ones and she would like to. She doesn't like to go to the local home ed groups, and when we do, she is unwilling to join in or even make an attempt to interact with the other children. I want to respect her wishes and not force her to go, but she has a dilemma. I'm not sure going to school full-time at the age of 11 years is the best thing for her, but I want to support her in making friends and doing what she thinks is best for herself. I fully entered into the spirit of supporting my older child's choice to try school, but I feel quite disillusioned by the whole process and somehow don't feel I've got the energy to face it again with either of them. But that doesn't seem fair, and I feel in conflict because I want to be supportive but find that hard if I don't really agree with the system. Help! We've agreed that perhaps their dad could go through the school process with them this time, and that seems fine with them, but I feel like I'm letting them down if I don't get involved, and I feel like I failed them in some way by not being able to help them meet their needs through unschooling. Maybe I'm being too idealistic? How do I balance my opinions with theirs? How can I be honest with my youngest daughter about how she feels and how she can get her needs met without influencing her? How do I convey the message to them both that they are loved for who they are and valued, whatever they choose, and that success can mean different things to different people, but also be true to myself when sometimes I have strong feelings about their choices? Thank you for your help. I listen every week and I'm inspired and encouraged and motivated by your wonderful chats. Well, thank you very, very much for your question. And there were a couple things, okay, three things that jumped out at me as I read through it. Um, And I just wanted to go through those and see if they connect with you in some way. So let's start with your comment about being true to yourself when you have strong feelings about your children's choices. So I just read through my blog post, Unschooling with Strong Beliefs, and I'll put that link in the show notes, with your circumstances in mind, your strong belief about the education system. And I think it holds up really well. So you might like to uh, go 
do that. Read it. I mean, there's different examples in there, but keep in mind, uh, filter it through your focus. And in it, I talk about ways to be involved and support our kids when they want to explore things that run counter to strong beliefs that we hold. There are many ways to support your child's wish to explore school while also respecting your principles about the challenges inherent in the system. So I was wondering if you listened to the podcast episode, Choosing School with Alex Polakowski, that's episode number 32. We talk a lot about ways to continue to live our unschooling principles while a child chooses to go to school. And to be clear, the child is no longer unschooling, but that doesn't mean we need to toss away all that we've learned through our unschooling experience about how people learn, about the importance of connection and trust in our relationships, etc. School can be a very different experience when we choose not to bring the system into our home. Even just dropping that compulsory nature makes it so different. The child knows it's their choice to go and that they have the option of leaving anytime. Also in that blog post, I talk about how our strong beliefs developed after we were interested enough to dive deeply into that topic, whatever it was learning and questioning and developing our own understanding. And we see how that fits into our view of the world. And that's what you were talking about. But we can't expect our children to just take our word for it. So with her interest in school, it sounds like your older daughter is now wanting to explore the topic of learning and how it weaves into our work choices as we get older. And that's cool. That can be something to celebrate. But notice she's getting lots of messages about school from the world around her, as evidenced by her comments to her younger sister, right, about how she won't learn anything or get a good job if she doesn't go to school. So I think it would be really helpful for your older daughter if she also began to learn how unschooling works, because it's clear from her comment that she doesn't. And as always, not in big sit down talks where the energy feels like you're trying to convince her of anything, trying to convince her not to go to school or that unschooling is is the best or whatever. But in digestible chunks as opportunities arise, just like those seeds we were talking about in the last question. Um, And in the conversations in the first question, that's like day to day unschooling. So, for example, next time it comes up, I'd ask why she thinks those things are true and see where the conversation goes. I'd also talk to her privately and ask her not to say those things to her sister because you don't believe they're true. And that could be another opening to a conversation about how learning works with unschooling. And the third thing that jumped out at me was the general focus on building friendships and a sense of belonging through home ed groups. I mean, they're great when you connect with the people in the group, but they're not essential. The connection with other people is a valuable thing. And just as being in the same class at school isn't really a strong basis for friendships to develop, neither is not going to school if that's all they have in common. So instead, maybe focus on what your daughter is interested in. Find others to connect with who share that interest, both in person and online. They're both valuable. But that's much more fertile ground for growing friendships and a sense of belonging to a community than just the fact that they don't go to school. I mean, we never did have any local home ed groups around here years ago when my kids were younger. And my kids found communities and friends through their interests that carried uh, throughout their day to day lives. And of course, we enjoyed uh, going to some unschooling conferences. We went once maybe twice a year and they can any connections that they made. They kind of they continued online. But day to day, it was really the love of their interests and passions and connecting with people that felt those that brought, you know, the the most joy to their days. Anna? Excuse me. Um, we definitely had ebbs and flows with friendships and activities over the lives of my girls. But I really saw that as a natural flow. And um, mine never saw school as a solution. But, you know, I've certainly known families who have tried that route. 
We found, just like Pam just said, that making friends really works best when focusing on common interests. And it often involved a lot from me, too. You know, sometimes I'd be running the clubs. I would be driving a lot in the city we live, a lot of driving to get to different things um, Mm -hmm. and researching and finding those things. And I know Pam did the same when finding a dojo and finding these things that then became a community, you know, to her children. You know, going to school is no guarantee of friends. It's still going to be the work of putting yourself out there. And we all know that socializing is a bit frowned upon (laughs) at school. (laughs) I would get the notes all the time. Um, So that child that, you know, is having trouble connecting at the homeschool group is probably going to find that they have the same issues at school, whereas maybe your other daughter thrives in that kind of group environment. And so that's just really different. And then, you know, they're going to have the added demands and expectations and busy work and stress and anxiety that can come along with school. So, you know, you mentioned that you want to support her in making friends. And and that's really where I think I'd spend my energy. You know, I'm guessing just from your short description that the large group activities just don't work for her. And so it's really maybe facilitating more one on one connections and, again, finding common interests and having relationships grow out of that common interest, be it you know, a craft or an art or photography or, you know, martial arts or a dance class or anything, you know, there's so many options out there. And again, it doesn't have to be homeschool oriented at all. You know, talk to her about what she's looking for and help brainstorm ways to make that happen. Um, I, I guess I just feel like there are ways to support their needs and to honor who you are too. And I think peeling back to the need is going to help open up a lot of solutions. School isn't the need. The need is something else and it might be friends or it might be some specific knowledge base or or whatever, but any of those things can be addressed in ways that don't include school and that allow them to thrive and create their own path. And I think, you know, Pam mentioned too, really discussing with your older child too, what, where that, where's that coming from for her? Because school is one route, but it can be very limiting. And I think some people can make it work for them, but they're having to work to make it work versus letting your life unfold and finding your path and doing it. It's a much faster route to getting to where you want to be in terms of um, joy and connection in life. So I don't know. I think there's just a lot of things there to look at and do and maybe think about your own perceptions of the situation and maybe your own language about the situation and see what's going on. But anyway, Anne? Yeah, I don't have much more to add that what hasn't already been said, but what you just said there about uh, your language, about what's going on, that's, Mm -hmm. you know, I first Mm -hmm. wondered if um, when your daughter wanted to go to school, if you supported her so incredibly wholeheartedly that um, you didn't have a conversation about uh, ways to meet her needs back then, uh, you know, in the real world and not saying, no, don't go to school, but they're, you know, talking about all the possibilities. And again, the conversation about what she needs and what, what she wants to get out of it and everything. So I'm wondering if that's how she got to a point of not really understanding unschooling um, and all that uh, it can offer to you. And that's and then she went to school and as you know, school sells the lie very well to most everybody that they are needed in order to have a successful life and everything. So, um, you know, that's all in the past and everything. So from here forward, again, as Pam and Anna were saying, the conversations are just so, so crucial and in a way that you're interested in hearing um, her point of view, her perspective and everything. And uh, if you believe in unschooling, you know, uh, just start talking about all the possibilities that are waiting for them to get exactly what they need and uh, without going through all that school might be because as uh, Pam and Anna had said also that it's just going to be kind of more of the same problems and everything and turn into probably a much larger scale because of um, the environment there so um, you know and when you said it's hard for them to swim against the tide and be different I don't think my kids ever really felt different when we're out in society because we created such, uh, you know, close knit 
space and we had so much faith in life and in joy and community. I mean, everybody, everywhere we went, the library knew us and my kids, uh, you know, knew these people that worked at the library and a personal level. The library director of the one we used to go to when they were little would seek out Jacob to talk about young adult books with her and everything. And um, everywhere we went, uh, and because you do get kind of the whole world to yourself when you're not in school, <laughs> which is really, really cool. And that's another... <laughs> That's another way also of finding um, people with similar interests because, you know, we go to the uh, planetarium or something when everybody else is in school. Look, there's another family there. And uh, one of uh, uh, we actually met a family from England and became super close friends with them because we went to a play and their son was carrying the British um version of the first Harry Potter book and of course we had to talk to him about it you know and then as we were watching the play I noticed the mom rubbing her kids shoulders and everything and connecting with them during the play and oh my gosh my heart was just so full because that's kind of rare to see uh, sadly <laughs> you know not not with uh you know my unschooling um uh, community and everything but in you know out in the general public so of course we just wanted to get to know them and they are not unschoolers and yet we had so much in common because we are, are both of our families are interested in the world and things of the world and uh common uh joyful things like video games that we would all do together you know there's just so much um, where your kids don't have to feel like they're even swimming against any stream because you're creating your own stream and uh, just believing in uh, your lives together and believing in the joy and believing in um, all that the world has to offer you and that can meet your needs. The end. <laughs> I just wanted to say I also got very excited, you know, listening to you guys and realized I'd be so curious to hear um, her daughter's answer, you know, because when you talk to her about why she's wanting to um, go back to school, right, when we when you start having these deeper conversations, because right now she's really just parroting that line, right, right. that, oh, that's what you, you have to do, you have to go to school to get your qualifications and so that you can get a good job, you know, to, to peel back that layer and to see what's really underneath that, that could also um, give you so much more insight into ways that you can support her and help her. Um, like Anna was saying too, about peeling back and finding out what the need is underneath, because especially it's a great clue when you just hear um, typical uh, sentence, typical phrases and stuff come out that there's something underneath that. Anyway, that just popped in my head. I thought it was interesting. <laughs> well, and, and so I'm going to say one more thing too, and then we'll move to question four, but like it, something that popped into my head when Anne was talking and, and I know maybe we can find it, Pam, I got your better at indexing all the stuff that you've talked about before but it kind of reminded me of how when we've talked about people like their child young child says oh I, I want to dance and then immediately we put them in a dance class yeah you know yeah. And so that kind of training basically right. is showing right. them okay oh I want to do this thing I need to go get this formal education yeah. and so I can even hear a little bit of that in the language of the question how even when you're talking about the alternative what you you said unschooling alternative, but yet the things you yeah. listed were courses Quite and formal. online, yeah. and <laughs> and so I just think there may be some room there to peel back some layers in yourself, you know, to think, oh, okay, am I? Did I really kind of set the stage for this? And again, that's not a problem or a judgment or whatever. It's just something to be aware of exactly. and to maybe yeah. open up to a bigger picture. Right. And that, you know, that that's de-schooling involved in that. And like I said, you know, do you believe in unschooling? You know, have that conversation with yourself and yep. uh, look, look around at your family and everything and um, just uh, go from that joy that I mean, I'm, we know the joy that unschooling brings into our lives. And you just, you know, go by that. Let that be your compass and uh, leave the school mindset, you know, where it belongs in the school. Right. Okay, so I, I will move on to question four if everybody's ready. And that is from um, Marianne in Southern California. 
Hello, ladies. The other day at the market, my son, nine, wanted to write the number on the label for a package of spices. I had already done so and didn't realize he wanted to, as he's never expressed an interest in writing at all, let alone at the market. After being a bit upset, he said again, I really wanted to write the number. So I said, how about we put on a new label and you can write it there? And he said, okay. So he tried to write it and the way he was holding the pen, the ink wasn't coming out. And I told him to hold it upright. It might work better. He tried to write a seven, but it looked more like an oval. He said, I'm so stupid. And I said, how about I hold your hand and we can write together? And he said, okay, we did it together. And again, he said, I'm so stupid. And he started to cry. He got close to his, I got close to his face and I told him, you aren't stupid. You're learning. I can use your help on writing the label for the tea. Can you help me? Again, we did the same thing amongst a few tears. He didn't want anyone to see his tears, so we faced away from the others. And then I asked him to help with dispensing the almond butter, and things got better. I'm hearing I'm so stupid is disheartening. He's never been interested in writing, nor have I ever asked him to do copy work or practice, etc. Only asked him to write his name on his dad's birthday card, to which I had to show him how to do the letters. I'm wondering if his statement can mean that as a parent, I don't praise his positive traits enough, like he's looking for a you're not dumb or you're so smart from me, or are his internal doubts and struggles about learning troubling him? He sees other kids writing at our weekly park day. I've told him I can help him with whatever he wants to learn is the weight of learning weighing him down. He's not a reader. And when I or my husband try to write letters down to help him with online code or command, he says, I don't want to learn. Looking for guidance and insights. Thanks for your generous support and perspective. So hi, Marianne. Um, I just first wanted to kind of reach out and, and hug both you and your son. I just, it's such a sweet, sensitive soul. And, you know, it was just your love for him was so clear in your letter to us. Um, it is so hard to hear our kids be tough on themselves. Um, I know that here I've heard language that has surprised me and at times filled with self-doubt and even anger. And it can absolutely feel like a punch in the gut to me. And I've learned over the years to kind of let that reaction wash over me and realize that words like stupid in the case of your son are said because they're the worst word they can think of at the moment. And they want us to know that this feeling is big and scary and serious. And I feel like you heard him and you engaged with him and he moved through it and that that's really beautiful. I, I feel like you were hearing him and doing it. So I just wanted to acknowledge that um, there may be times away from the big feelings where you can put out feelers to see if there's anything else going on. Maybe someone said something to him, a friend or even a family member. Sometimes those things happen and we don't know. And then they kind of come out in this self-doubt or anger that we don't really understand where it's coming from. So sometimes that's helpful to to, to dig into a little bit. Um, and I think there's just always room for us to celebrate who our children are right now. So make sure it's not just, I can help you learn when you're ready, because while that seems fine, and obviously it's fine, but it's also that it's a deficit focus. So finding ways to celebrate what he loves and where he shines and what he's doing right now can go a long way in helping him see himself as whole right now, because he is whole and amazing and right where he needs to be. And so that energy is something that you can hold in that picture and that vision of himself. And then he can kind of bask in that light of that love and acceptance of who he is and all the amazing things he's doing right now, because you just mentioned coding and other things. Clearly he has passions and things that he's doing and interested in. And, and that can certainly be celebrated. And uh, yeah, I, also got cold chills when I read goosebumps when I read about your response to him um, at the store and everything, how you protected him from feeling embarrassed and everything. And that was very beautiful. Um, I am interested, though, in your question, is the weight of learning weighing him down? Because in, in our family, there, uh, you know, learning wasn't separate from life. And um so how, I'm wondering how you might come to that question. Are you talking about learning all the time? And I see that you, you are talking a bit and he's gotten to the point where he's don't, I don't want to learn. So I just really want you to um, 
pay attention to uh, what you're saying and what you are, how you're describing your unschooling lives. Again, as we talked before, it's our language about everything. And um, if if the the word learning is coming up a lot in your unschooling lives, um, it just isn't really necessary because your focus is on what he loves to do and everything. And, you know, the um, grocery store incident aside, when he's uh, wanting to write letters down for code or command or everything, um, if you just, you know, ask him if you want him, if he wants you to do it, um, you know, I mean, we just kind of don't need to focus on the fact that he is learning. We just need to trust in that because that's what unschooling is we trust in that that it happens throughout our lives and uh so the you know just i just really want you to pay attention to if you are speaking of learning then that is handing him the weight of learning um unless he's picking up somewhere else like anna said uh but again just take a look at your everyday lives and make sure that you're not handing him that weight of the learning yourself and the other thing, um, when he's saying he's stupid, uh, I, uh, Anna connected with that really well. And I also just want to um, talk about how we all kind of feel stupid once in a while. And to validate that, I think, would be really, really huge because, you know, we've all, I say it a few times a day, perhaps, um, how stupid I am that I did that. And I don't mean it when I say it about myself. And if it is a more challenging thing, you know, then it may come out harsher about myself and everything. Um, so if you can separate yourself from that and not own that weight that he's feeling, then that will, uh, you know, uplift everybody. And to validate him, his frustration with not being able to write what he wanted to write um, and validate him, uh, you know, we all feel stupid sometimes, you know, I'm, I know exactly how you're feeling. That would probably really help him to um, have some of the weight that he's owning in a sensitive heart, <laughs> you know, float away and, uh, I have a highly sensitive child, as I always say, and I uh, used to talk to him about um, not letting things go straight to his heart um, so much and envision things that bothered him maybe going above his head and floating right out the door and a visual for him uh, to help him deal with things that were frustrating and not just destroy him all the time was really, really valuable. And he still uses, you know, something much like that today at age 27. So um, the other thing is, so after, if you if he says he's stupid and you don't take it, um, you validate him, you know, with uh, authenticity and uh, radical validation, understanding what he's feeling. If, if you feel like he's ready to shift after that, then perhaps make a shift talking about, you know, something that may make him light up. What show were you watching before, you know, we came to the store or um, talk about what you're doing after you go to the store, just so that it's apparent to him that you're not owning his weight of one, not being able to write and two, uh, the fact that he's called himself stupid. Um, again, the validation is important, but there's always the possibility to shift again, shift afterward towards something that um, can help him feel lighter and something that he uh, is looking forward to something in which he shines. So, um, I talk about owning weight a lot in our Childhood Redefined Online Summit, and uh, I, I, because I had a child who carried the weight of the world on his shoulders and still does often, I talk about um, what we can do to release that and shift away from that. And, you know, the things I've said here are uh, really good places to start with you um, helping him to release his weight. So um, that's all I have to say, Pam. Hi, Marianne. Thank, Thank you so much for your question. And yes, I definitely uh, felt for you guys through that. It was uh, a wonderful moment. Um, but I don't think I, I want to focus more on your can, your question about if his statement might mean that as a parent, you're not praising his positive traits enough. That's kind of what jumped out at me. Because I don't think the takeaway from the experience is to <clears throat> increase your generic praise, like you're so smart, really doesn't say anything, right? 
I think it could be an opportunity to share your observation about how people learn things, uh, like men I mentioned in the last question. And as you did when you replied, you aren't stupid, you're learning. Um, and all that validation and reflection that Anne talked about. I would also keep those moments light. Um, again, you know, back to depending on your met metaphor, not owning that weight, let him see in your eyes and your words and your body language that absolutely this is nothing to be concerned about. And then from there, you know, if this is something um, that seems to he seems to be caught on uh, from you mentioning that he'll say things like, I don't want to learn, et cetera. Um, they made some great points about that, but I'd also like to say that you can like f when that happened around here, I would watch for opportunities to share little observations that support my statement, you know, that you're not stupid, you're learning. Um, for example, maybe the next time he shares something that he's learned about something that he's interested in, because that's the point, right? You could mention, oh, that's so interesting. You know, you're learning so much about X because you're interested in it. It's just, just a quick little observation. You, you can help him notice the learning in the living that he's doing if that's something that he's concerned about or that he's blocked about, that, that he is, that he is, has is owning a uh, separation between learning and living. Or when you notice him getting better at a repetitive skill, you can share that. Oh, you, you got through the, the game puzzle so much faster now that you've done it a few times. Um, maybe you mentioned how the more you do something, the easier it gets, right? You're sharing examples from your lives. Maybe at some point you explicitly compare it with writing, how it typically gets easier with practice. Uh, maybe when you're out and about and you notice hard to read handwriting that was written by an adult, you point that out too. You know, this isn't all like quickly in, you know, tr because that would be overpowering, but little connections here and there as they come up in your lives. That's what also helps um, share the observation that all this is happening in our lives right that it's all wrapped up in there it doesn't need to be separate things you don't need to sit down to learn something um that it comes up and that's when we notice it and when we're interested and we do it more often we uh, get more skilled at it etc and and those are just little connections that he's making as he figures out how the world works how learning works how how just focusing on his joy and the things he's interested in are giving him all these things already and then uh, you can take your direction for future uh, comments or shares or little questions based on his reactions to those comments which ones spark conversations with him which ones he reacts negatively to that helps you see where his thoughts are so that you can meet him where he is and then share more of the things that will connect with him. Um, that's kind of the dance of relationships that we often talk about here. That's kind of what it looks like. But so comments like you're so smart, they, they just sit there. They don't lead to conversation. And it's in that conversation where we learn so much about each other and about how we engage with the world. And it's, and it's how we learn so much about our child and it's how we get better at meeting them where they are. The other big piece of that is, is not, um, not being overwhelmed by the thought that maybe, uh, it, it might not, they may react and not like something that we said, they, they'll, you know, change the subject or they won't answer your question or whatever. That's just more information for us and helps us take a step closer to where they are. So the, it's not a bad thing because often, so often we get scared of what they might say or think or infer um, that we don't say anything. But if we share and we have these conversations, you know, I think that kind of runs through all pretty much all the questions that we've had today. Have these conversations, learn more about what each other's thinking, peel back those layers so that we can um, build our connections, better understand each other. And that's where that trust comes from, too, so that we can move forward from there. Right. And it's a, a building the trust again, as I was saying before, in your lives of the unschool, your unschooling lives and those things that you mentioned, Pam, the things you talk about. 
you know, uh, that is the learning without having to say, this is how you're learning. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? Yeah, exactly. And, and, <laughs> and it's, it is just a way of life. It always was just a way of life with us that we would talk about everything. And I think I've mentioned before how we would go out to dinner and everybody would look at us like we were so weird because we just would not stop talking in our family and nobody else could, you know, these other tables couldn't think of anything <laughs> to say to each other. And we're just like, so it's, it, you, you become this, this unit of this, you know, this joyful unit that's having conversations and making things work and everything. And it's just, I just love it. <laughs> yes, I do too. And I think, don't you think this may be related kind of to that other question too? Like they are segmenting learning, like you said, exactly. Anne, and, it, it, and it's not. And so look at that language and maybe how you're segmenting things into these learning brackets, but really it's all just life. And yeah, we would just, if somebody needed something, I'd write it down. I, I didn't make exactly. it a teachable moment. I just wrote right. it down. And, and well, as I wrote it down, they realized, oh, okay. And then over the years, it, it evolves. Yes, that term teachable moment is just <laughs> everywhere lately. And that's, and they believe that this is the right thing to say because a child's doing something in real life, okay. you know, so they're like, oh, make sure you let them know to teach it. You know, this is a teachable mm -hmm. moment. No, let it be life. And yeah. we have the amazing gift of doing that, of letting us, letting our children just live and uh, just bringing the world to them and the way things work with conversations when we're not only giving information, we're so interested in hearing what they think about it also, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And in these conversations about conversations, <laughs> I always love to point out in, in case some people um, are like, oh, but my child doesn't like to talk or, or whatever. They're not a conversationalist, whatever. Mm -hmm. That's not the point no. because actions are also communicating uh, information, right? Those are conversations. They're talking through their actions. They're telling you what they like, what they dislike. When you are paying attention and observing their choices and seeing, oh, look at, you know, realizing the three things they looked at and the one they chose to take further, etc. you can still learn so much. The same thing you do through conversations um, through. So instead of me maybe saying something or asking a question, and I would offer up something, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and it's like, oh, I think they'd like this and I'll share this and uh, that or send this link or that link and seeing where that goes. So it doesn't all literally need to be worse. Right. right. <laughs> well, and I, I always talk to myself, too. So my kids are used to that also. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, it's just say stuff out loud all the time. So maybe they're listening, maybe they're not. It doesn't matter. Yeah. If you want to talk, they will. So it's, you know, no pressure to have the conversation, as we've been saying. It's not a sit down kind of thing. It's just, yeah, it's, life. It's, for us, it's this uh, enthusiasm that's bubbling up in us where we, you know, want to talk about stuff. Right. So, exactly. Beautiful. And that is the last question for this month. I want to thank you guys so much for answering questions with me. It's always so fun. Yay, thank you. Yay. And just a reminder for everyone, there are links in the show notes for the things that we've mentioned in the episode. And as always, if you'd like to submit a question for the Q&A show, just go to livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast and click on the link. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Bye, Bye. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. While you're there, be sure to pick up your free copy of my book, What is Unschooling? In it, we'll explore some of the common questions people have when they first hear about unschooling. Like, how will my child learn? How do I know they're learning? What is de-schooling? And how do I get started? It's also available at many online ebook retailers. And if you'd like to connect online, you can find me on Facebook at Living Joyfully. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.